Thank you all for uh, attending this uh, first Applied PD seminar of the uh, fall quarter. Um, so um, I want to introduce our uh, speaker, Margaret Beck from Boston University. Uh, Margaret uh, got her PhD, in fact, at Boston University, and you know, she's one of the lucky ones who gets to go back uh, to see from. Um, but uh, you know, before uh, you know, she ended back up at Boston University, she had a number of uh, postdoctoral positions uh, at uh, Brown, for instance, uh, and then also a time at uh, MSRI. Uh, and then she um, uh, became tenure track first at Harriet Watt before returning to Boston University, where she's now been since, uh, I believe, 2009. Is that correct? Yeah. And we're now, uh, an associate professor. Uh, and she's also the, um, I believe, the most recent recipient of the uh, Crawford Prize from the SIM Activity Group on Dynamical Systems. Uh, and today she'll tell us about spectral stability, the Maslow Index, and spatial dynamics. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, thanks, Bernard, for the nice introduction. Um, thanks thanks to, for the invitation. Um, thanks to all of you for being here. So, yeah, so let's see. So um, I'm gonna talk about spectral stability, the Maslow Index, and spatial dynamics. Um, I will explain what all of those um, words mean. So if, if like, that sounds unfamiliar, don't, don't worry. Um, so I'm listing a bunch of collaborators here. Um, so I will mention um, various people's names and various results when they come up. Um, but I, one thing I wanna say is that um, part of the reason there's like a nice big group of people here is that um, a lot of this work came out of uh, what's called a square at AIM. So AIM is the American Institute of Mathematics. It for a long time was in Palo Alto and now it's in San Jose, California. And a square stands for Structured Quartet Research Ensemble. So it's this really cool program where um, you get a group of four to six people together. Um, and if your proposal is accepted, then you get to spend one week at AIM um, in three consecutive summers um, working on your group's research program. And um, that was like a really wonderful experience. And so um, most of the people mentioned here were part of that square um, for at least one of the summers. Um, uh, also, I'm noticing a typo. So Jonathan Jaquette, um, so I'll go through. So Graham is at um, Memorial University in Newfoundland. Um, Jonathan, um, uh, this is a typo. So Jonathan was, at a, was a postdoc at Brandeis and he recently just moved to BU actually um, this summer and is now at BU. So that's a typo. So he's at BU. So apologies to Jonathan. Um, Yuri Latushkin, um, Robbie Marangel, Aleem Suktayev, uh, Ryan Goh, Chris Jones, Simon Malam, and Kelly McQuigan. Kelly was a postdoc at BU um, and now she works at Google, um, but her she was um, definitely part of this while she was at BU. So, okay, so let me get started. Um, oops. Okay, um, can you all see my um, mouse? Like, can I point at stuff? Yes. Okay, awesome, great. Okay, so um, the first thing I wanna do is go through sturm liouville theory, which is um, very classical. So if you've, if you've seen this before, this will be a review. Um, if you haven't seen it before, um, much of the intuition for what I'm gonna say later can be seen in this um, sort of very classical setting. So I wanna kind of go through this in detail because really the intuition um, is, is very similar in, in the sort of more complicated cases. So, so suppose we have an eigenvalue problem. So, so um, eigenvalue problem here, um, so L is my notation for my linear operator. So this is a second order operator. L or lambda is my eigenvalue parameter. And at the moment we're working on a bounded interval with zero Dirichlet boundary conditions at the ends. And um, the classical way to analyze these eigenvalue problems is to use what are called proof or coordinates, which in, for this, this, the way I've written down the operator here, they're basically just polar coordinates, except for many people, the roles of sine and cosine are reversed. Um, so you define new variables R and theta, and then you obtain this first order system for R and theta. Now, you know, if you have a second order problem like this, the sort of um, standard way to define a first order system would be defined like ux to be v, and then vx would be whatever the second derivative of u is given by the equation. So this is just a different way of taking a second order a scalar equation and writing it as a first order system in two variables. And so our variables are r and theta, the amplitude and angle of these polar-like coordinates. So if you write down the dynamics for r and theta, this is what you get. 
Um, and there's a couple key things to observe about these equations. So first of all, the equation for theta decouples. So there's no R dependence at all in this equation for theta. Um, so we can study the dynamics of theta without any reference to R. Um, secondly, if you look at the R equation, I have this factor of R sitting here in the front. So that means the set R equals zero is invariant. So if we want to have an, an, a solution to this eigenvalue problem, we have to have both the equation and the boundary condition satisfied. So the boundary conditions say that u has to be zero at the ends of the interval. So the way that u is related to r and theta, that means at the ends of the interval, either r needs to be zero, but if r is zero, it's zero for all x, and I have a trivial solution, which is not what I want. So therefore, the only way for you to satisfy the boundary conditions is if sine of theta is zero, which means that I need theta to be an integer multiple of pi at the ends of my interval. Okay, so, so, so by looking at the R equation, we see since R equals zero is invariant, we have a non-trivial solution to the eigenvalue problem if and only if um, theta is equal to an integer multiple of pi at the ends of the interval. And then moreover, so if you look at the theta equation, um, so because um, you know, cosine squared and sine squared are both positive. If lambda is large and negative, sufficiently large and negative, um, the entire right-hand side of the equation for theta will be positive, and so theta will be forced to oscillate. So we're basically, um, theta is going to be moving around the circle, and we want to, like, pay attention to when it lands on integer multiples of pi. Okay, so again, since the theta equation decouples, we're going to forget about the R equation. And we just wanna ask, when do we have a solution to this equation that is um, an integer multiple of pi at the two ends of the interval? And by periodicity, we can just assume without loss of generality that at the left-hand endpoint, we start when theta is equal to zero. We evolve forward in X and we ask, does theta land on an integer multiple of pi at the other end of the interval? If it does land on an integer multiple of pi, then lambda is an eigenvalue. Um, and if it doesn't, then that value of lambda was not an eigenvalue. So lambda is a parameter in this ODE. And it, it, by varying lambda, we can sort of vary the dynamics of theta. And, and it'll change whether or not we land on that integer multiple of pi. So here's a, here's a yeah. Um, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So. Um, the theta equation decouples, so uh, you can say, you quote unquote, solve the theta equation. That goes into the R equation, now you solve the R equation. But then you still have the constraint that R cosine theta needs to be the derivative of R sine theta. Right? Oh, uh, yeah. So that's, that's, that was sort of used to determine the equations for R and theta. That's already used, okay. Yeah, so, so as long as you're solving this system of equations for R and theta, then u and u prime will be related in the appropriate way and they will solve and u will solve the original second order equation. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And thanks for asking the question. Definitely interrupt me at any point. And if, if um, people want to put a question like in the chat instead, um, I'm, that's, that's okay with me, but I don't know maybe if, if somebody else can let me know that there's a question in the chat because I can't see the chat with my thing on full screen. But anyway, okay, great. Okay, so, so we're focusing on the dynamics of theta. And so this is a picture that just relates u back to theta. So here's what my eigenfunction looks like. So u is r um, cosine, excuse me, u is r sine theta. So if theta starts at zero, u starts at zero. And then as theta goes around, okay, we, we don't really know what the dynamics of r is doing, but the point is theta goes around. When it lands here, this corresponds to this other zero of my eigenfunction. It keeps going around, it lands here. Oops, sorry. It lands here. This corresponds to the next zero of the eigenfunction, and it keeps going around. And for this particular example I've shown, it lands at x equals b over here at pi. And so my, my solution has satisfied the Dirichlet boundary conditions at the two ends of the interval. OK? So um, we're sort of thinking about the dynamics or the, the existence of an eigenfunction in terms of thinking about oscillations of theta. So, um, so again, with this perspective is we start with our initial condition where theta is equal to zero. So here I've just rewritten the equation for theta. We flow forward and we see if we land in an integer multiple of pi. 
So when lambda is very large and negative, theta prime is positive, so theta is forced to oscillate. So we know that if we make lambda sufficiently large and negative, we're going to be able to find an eigenvalue. So let's assume we've found one. Let's label it in the following way. We're gonna label it lambda k if the value that theta lands on at the right point of the interval is k plus one multiples of pi. So that's our labeling convention. So here, this is the real axis. This is the axis where the eigenvalues live. Um, I guess I should have mentioned this operator L is self-adjoint, so all of the eigenvalues are real. So we found an eigenvalue here at lambda k. It corresponds to theta landing on k plus one pi. So we've gone around the half circle k plus one times. Then what happens is we continuously increase lambda so as we increase lambda, we decrease the amount of oscillation in theta because of this minus sign. So theta will oscillate less and it's varying continuously in lambda. So there's gonna be a gap until we increase lambda enough so that now we exactly land on one fewer half rotation. So when lambda gets to some special value that I'm labeling lambda k minus one, theta lands on k pi and so forth. And we keep going. So the largest eigenvalue lambda naught is the value of lambda such that theta goes around the circle exactly one half rotation. And if we keep increasing lambda anymore, so there's this like monotonicity relationship between the value of lambda and the derivative of theta. So if we keep increasing lambda, we're not going to find any more eigenvalues because theta sort of is no longer able to get around the circle in one half rotation. Um, and you know, you can, I'm just giving you the sort of intuition for this. You can make all of this um, rigorous and precise and check that really there is a largest eigenvalue and this process has to stop and all of those kind of things. Okay. So I'm um, using these ideas. So here I've just rewritten the eigenvalue problem in U. Um, one can prove there exists a decreasing sequence of simple eigenvalues. So lambda is the top one and they go down. Okay. And they correspond, the, the, the eigenvalues correspond to the number of oscillations in theta, which corresponds to the number of simple zeros that the eigenfunction has in the interior of the interval. So a labeling convention, we have lambda k and the eigenfunction uk then has k simple zeros. So here I've drawn a picture, this is U2. So it has two zeros in the interior of the interval. And the convention is lambda two, theta lands on three pi. So we start here, we have one zero, another zero, and then we get back to uh, our zero Dirichlet boundary condition over here. Okay, is this um, making sense? Uh, just please let me know if, if, if it's not making sense. Can I ask a question real quick? What yeah. are the conditions on alpha? Does that have to be continuous or? Yeah, so you want it to be continuous. Um, I don't, I don't, to be honest, I don't remember if you need any kind of smoothness requirements. I mean, presumably you don't want it, you definitely don't want it to like, like um, blow up in any kind of way because that'll kind of mess up this idea that if lambda is sufficiently large and negative, you can force theta to oscillate. Um, so yeah. Yeah, there's going to be some kind of conditions to make sure you don't end up with some kind of pathological example. Yes. Okay. Um, great. So what are the consequences for um, stability in reaction diffusion equations? So one of the things I first said in the title is that this is going to be I'm going to be thinking about spectral stability. So what do I mean? So here is a scalar reaction diffusion equation. So U is just a scalar valued function here. Um, and suppose I have a stationary solution phi. Um, so that means phi satisfies this equation, but it has no time derivative. So then I am interested in its stability. So what I do is I linearize around it. So, so this operator L is now the linearization of the PDE about phi. And the spectrum of L will tell me something about the stability of phi. So spectral stability, so phi would be said to be spectrally stable if the spectrum of this linearization L is um, contained in the left half plane. And you have to talk about what you mean when there's spectrum on the imaginary axis. So that's a, that's a borderline case. 
And in fact, it's a very relevant borderline case because um, generally speaking, we expect there to be a zero eigenvalue. So notice, so remember phi is a stationary solution. So this here is the equation that phi satisfies. If you take an additional spatial derivative of this entire equation, what you get is here. And this right-hand side is exactly the linear operator L applied to the eigenfunction, excuse me, applied to the derivative of the solution. So in other words, the derivative of the underlying solution is an eigenfunction with eigenvalue zero. So what does this mean about stability? So we might hope that zero is the largest eigenvalue because that would mean if zero is the largest eigenvalue, that would mean there are no positive eigenvalues, which would mean that the pulse is spectrally stable. Um, there's gonna be an issue about translation invariance and all of that, but, the, but just let's, let's say that spectrally stable means there are no positive eigenvalues. Um, well, so, so how is this related to sturm liouville theory? Well, let's suppose phi looks like a pulse. So here's my pulse. Here is what the derivative must look like qualitatively. And notice that there is, there is a single zero of my pulse. Um, I am glossing over the fact that what the analysis I showed you on the previous two slides was for a bounded interval, AB. And now I'm talking about a reaction diffusion equation posed on the entire real line. So I guess I'm just asking you to trust me that the same uh, general ideas can be proven in the case of the entire real line. Um, there's a few extra details you have to worry about, but the ideas are the main ideas are still the same. Um, so here's my eigenfunction phi prime, and it has a single zero in the interior of the domain. And the eigenvalue associated with this eigenfunction is zero. So by our labeling convention, a single zero means it's the eigenvalue that we labeled lambda one and it's the eigenfunction that we called u1. But remember, lambda1 was not the largest eigenvalue. The largest eigenvalue, lambda0, corresponds to an eigenfunction with no zeros. And so lambda0 must be bigger than lambda1. So if lambda1 is zero, that implies that lambda0 is strictly positive. So it implies that there is a positive eigenvalue, which implies that the pulse or this pulse is necessarily spectrally unstable. So this is a really powerful result. It, I, so like I'm not making any assumptions about, uh, other than like some maybe some smoothness assumptions, which I'm not really mentioning. The, the only assumption I'm really making is that this function f here supports the existence of a pulse solution. Um, no other details about the pulse matter. It is forced to be unstable because of sturm liouville theory. So there's something topological here um, in, 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 in the dynamics um, of the oscillations that's sort of forcing the existence of uh, a positive eigenvalue. And another key takeaway here is that um, we're using the zeros of the eigenfunctions as a proxy for counting the number of eigenvalues. So what I'm saying here is that the eigenfunction associated with eigenvalue zero has a single zero. So that tells me one zero means there is one, eigen, one positive eigenvalue. If my profile here had looked different and such that there were say three zeros for its derivative, that would then tell me that there have to be three positive eigenvalues. So we're really using the zeros of the eigenfunction um, as a proxy for the positive eigenvalues. So that's gonna be an important idea later. Okay. Excuse me, Margaret. Yeah. Uh, how come? How come it's necessary that U is in L two? Oh, um, I'm just. That's just the standard space where people usually prove sturm liouville theory. So, okay. and also, I mean, the idea is. So this is a good question because you know when you do an eigenvalue problem like here on a bounded domain, you have the equation and you have boundary conditions. Uh, and it's important to know which boundary conditions you're talking about because that can affect the properties of the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions. Um, when you're working on the entire real line, there's not really a mention of boundary conditions in a direct sense, but what replaces the idea of boundary conditions is specifying what function space you're working in. So if you change the function space that you're um, requiring your eigenfunctions to live in, you can change the properties of the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions 
much the same way that if you change the boundary conditions in the case of a compact interval, you or a bounded interval, you can change the properties, of the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions there. And so um, there's often many reasonable choices for which function space to work in. Um, L2 is sort of the canonical choice in the context of stern louisville theory. But um, whatever you choose, it's just important to uh, sort of, well, first of all, make a good choice, but also be precise about which function space you're working in, because that, that can affect the outcome in terms of whether or not the solution is stable. Thank you. Yep, yep, that's a great question. Uh, I've got a question too, Margaret. Yeah, great. So if you had a, um, if you had a reaction diffusion equation, which had a um, traveling wave pole solution that had N peaks, uh, so in other words, they would have, uh, I guess, uh, two N minus one spots where the derivative is zero. Yeah. Then that would automatically mean that you have two N minus one positive eigenvalues. Uh, yeah, if it's a scalar equation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's Thanks. right. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, I guess that, that's also, you bring up a good issue, which is that um, I, I, so far I'm assuming this solution is stationary. If, you know, if I were a traveling wave, you would want to first go into a moving coordinate frame and do all of this, and then you would get an extra term here that was like C, C, U, X. Right. But then you, there's this like trick where you put the equation into self-adjoint form and you sort of get rid of that first order term in, in some sense. And so uh, the theory um, will still work, um, but there's just some, some tweaking you have to do uh, if your solution is, is traveling. Does that put you in an uh, exponentially weighted space then? Because now that, that because the transformation to put you in, uh, in self-adjoint form is exponential? Um, let's see, I think, that's a good question. Um, it sort of depends on what the transformation to go into self-adjoint form would look like. I don't think um, it will necessarily require you to be in a weighted function space. I think it's going to depend on the details of the problem. So another thing that, that's sort of lurking in the background here that I have not mentioned is um, when you're working on the full real line, you have not only point spectrum, but you also have essential spectrum. And so um, your essential spectrum um, in the most stable case is, is completely contained in the left half plane. It's bounded away from the imaginary axis and you sort of don't have to worry about it. And when you have the self-adjoint case like I've written here, the essential spectrum is, is um, a half line. It lies on the, the negative real axis. Um, if it's stable. Right. Um, and so when you have a traveling wave and you have a CUX term, that essential spectrum opens up into a parabola. And mm -hmm. the weighted function space is usually associated with the case when the essential spectrum is not stable. So if that essential spectrum comes up and touch the, touches the imaginary axis or is possibly um, positive in the positive half plane, and then going into the weighted function space will like push that essential spectrum um, off to the left, ideally. So um, whether or not your self-adjoint transformation also happens to add some particular type of, of, of weight to your function space that, that kind of changes the picture a little bit, um, probably is, I'm, I'm guessing, is sort of related to whether or not uh, the essential spectrum to begin with is stable or unstable. Um, that's a little bit of a guess, but I think it's, I think it's related to that. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Well, um, like sure. Um, it's about uh, that space. Uh, L2, I still don't understand why you need uh, L2. Normally it's for further inequality for some kind of integral inequalities, but you definitely need a uh, uh, C2, right? Otherwise, you will not be able to differentiate. So maybe some kind of intersection with smoothness. Um, so I think, okay, so so I definitely, I see what you're saying. You're talking about like the fact that since there's two derivatives here, the natural domain, you would think it might be C2. Is yeah. this what you're asking? So yeah, so what you can do, since this is a second order operator, um, you can talk about weak solutions 
Um, and so, and, and then you can sort of show the existence of weak solution. Then after the fact, you can show that actually the solutions are more smooth. So um, I, I, don't, I don't think you necessarily have to work in C2. Um, you might like the natural, like for weak, weak solutions, I think the natural function space is um, like, H2 with the domain, sorry, H1 where the domain of the operator is H2. And so your weak solutions only live necessarily in H1, but then you can sort of do a bootstrapping argument after the fact to show that they're actually as smooth as, the, as you would like. Um, I guess I just wrote down L2 not to imply that like you have to work in L2, but just the classical Sturm Louisville theory tends to be stated with everything, with L2 as being the base space. So I guess you would. So, so, um, but you can definitely, this is like L2 is not, you're not like forced to do it in L2 or anything like that. Um, you, you have, you have some freedom there in choosing which space you work in. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. All right. So, um, let me, I want to, keep, so again, this is a little bit more classical Sturm Louisville theory. I want to switch perspectives a little bit, um, and talk about something called a conjugate point. So I want to return to the same eigenvalue problems before. So this is just the equation for theta I've rewritten. So previously we had the domain fixed to be the interval a, b, and we varied the eigenvalue parameter lambda. So now I want to change the perspective and fix the eigenvalue parameter lambda and instead vary the domain. So now my domain is going to be the interval a to s, where s is my parameter, and S can be anywhere um, in this half interval here. So I'm S is basically controlling the extent to which I'm shrinking the original spatial domain. So here is, so again, I'm, I'm gonna play the same game. So I'm gonna assume without loss of generality, I'm looking for an eigenvalue that I start on the left endpoint at zero. And then I flow forward to see if I land in an integer multiple of pi. But now I care about whether or not I'm landing in an integer multiple of pi at x equals s, not at x equals b. OK, and I want to see for that fixed value of lambda, for which values of s am I landing in an integer multiple of pi? So again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to fix my eigenvalue parameter to be an actual eigenvalue for the problem on the full domain, lambda k, which means that if we were to choose s to be b by our labeling convention from before, we would we know that at that right endpoint, we would land on k plus 1 multiples of pi. So um, in other words, if s is equal to b, so if I take the full domain, since lambda is fixed and equal to lambda k, I land on k plus 1 pi. So I'm going to label B to be the conjugate point. I'm labeling it as SK. And then, again, because as I shrink, continuously shrink the domain, I vary S continuously, the dynamics of theta will vary continuously. And so um, the amount of oscillation is going to decrease continuously until I land on the next conjugate point, which I label SK minus 1, which is exactly the value of S where I have k multiples of pi that I land on. Okay, so, so um, I'm, I can continuously decrease this parameter s, and every time I land on a value of s such that I have effectively an eigenfunction on that reduced domain, I label that value of s as a conjugate point. So um, you, you notice that um, I get the same idea, I get this like same sequence of isolated conjugate points and there is, in this case, a smallest one, which is when theta goes around exactly halfway around the circle. And then if I keep de decreasing s, theta won't have enough time to do any sufficient amount of oscillating. And so I won't have any more, eigen, any more conjugate points. OK, so um, what, what you get here is this um, thing that, that we, my collaborators and I called the square. It's a relationship between eigenvalues and conjugate points. So here, here on the horizontal axis, I've plotted uh, the, 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 real, the, the real line where my eigenvalues lambda live. Here on the vertical axis, I've plotted the real line where the values of s live. So s is allowed to vary between a and b. And in this interval, I've, I find conjugate points. 
um, when S is equal to B, so I have the full interval and I'm letting lambda vary, I find eigenvalues. So the blue dots correspond to eigenvalues. So the idea is if I fix a value of um, lambda and I let S vary, I'm finding conjugate points. If I fix a value of S and I let lambda vary, I'm finding eigenvalues. And what you can prove is that if you choose lambda to be sufficiently large, you're, you're not going to find any conjugate points. Uh, I'm not going through the details of that, but you can prove that. And it, also, if you collapse the interval down to a point, so if you choose s equal to a, then somehow trivially, you don't have any eigenvalues because you can't have any non-trivial solutions because they're not doing anything. So what you see is that um, the number of conjugate points for a fixed value of lambda, so here there are three of them, has to be equal to the number of eigenvalues um, that are larger than that fixed value of lambda. So you get this like one-to-one -one relationship between the eigenvalues and the conjugate points. So in other words, um, counting the number of conjugate points for a fixed value of lambda is equivalent to counting the number of eigenvalues that are strictly bigger than that same value of lambda. Um, and yes. Um, so if you choose your lambda star to be one of the eigenvalues themselves, are the conjugate points then basically telling you where the zeros of your eigenfunction are? Um, exactly. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so, right. So before this idea of um, using the zeros of the eigenfunction as a proxy for a count of the eigenvalues, now we're using the conjugate points as a proxy for the count of the number of eigenvalues. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Um, I, I, I've um, also noticed a typo here. This should be lambda 2, lambda 1, and lambda 0. Lambda 0 should be the largest one, and lambda 2 should be the smallest one. So sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so, so again, the idea is if we're interested in spectral stability, what we want to do is we want to count the number of unstable eigenvalues, which means I'm going to want to choose lambda star to be 0 so that by counting conjugate points, which as was just pointed out in that case is exactly counting the zeros of the corresponding eigenfunction, gives me a count of the number of positive eigenvalues. So I can detect instabilities by counting conjugate points. If I can't, if there are no conjugate points, then I have spectral stability. But if there exist conjugate points, then I have unstable eigenvalues. So here's just the picture when you choose lambda star to be zero, and it says that the number of conjugate points is then equal to the number of unstable eigenvalues. Um, sometimes that's given a, a special name. It's called the Morse index of the operator. Although you have to be careful, there's a sign convention here. Um, I was putting a plus sign in front of um, my second derivative term. So um, some people put a minus sign there and then refer to the Morse index of the operator as the number of negative eigenvalues. Um, but in any case, so this square here, the square relationship is often referred to as the Morse index theorem. Um, it's very classical. Um, it goes back to the work of Morse and Bott. Um, and you, you can think about it as, as in, very much in the context of sturm liouville theory. OK, so this is um, like a, a very powerful tool um, counting eigenvalues by instead counting conjugate points. And as we saw in the example of the pulse solution of the reaction diffusion equation, it has very immediate um, consequences. For example, you can conclude immediately that any pulse of a scalar reaction diffusion equation is necessarily unstable, um, which is a pretty general and powerful statement. OK. So, um, Okay, so this is just the summary. So um, I guess I've, I've already said these three um, bullet points. Um, I guess um, one thing I, I haven't emphasized that in, in the scalar case, um, there, there was a, an important monotonicity in the eigenvalue parameter lambda in the, when we were first talking about eigenvalues and in the um, conjugate point parameter s. So in other words, as we increased lambda, uh, theta prime decreased. There is a, a fixed relationship between the way in which I vary lambda and the way that affects the derivative of theta. And the same with s. As we shrink the spatial domain, we reduce the amount of time theta has to oscillate. So there's a monotonicity there. Um, so that's going to come up later. And so all of this sort of begs the question. So it was very much important in the Sturm-Liouville theory that our equation was a scalar. 
the fact that u is a scalar is what allowed us to use those polar coordinates. So the first question is, can we generalize this to systems where u is a vector? Um, it's not at all clear one would be able to do that because we can't use polar coordinates anymore. Um, and then the other question is, can we generalize this to multidimensional spatial domains? Okay, so let me talk about the, the case of systems. Um, so again, here I've just written down a system of reaction diffusion equations. So u is now a vector. Um, in order to um, do the analysis I want, I need to make an important assumption that restricts the class of equations I consider, which is this assumption that f is given by the gradient of some function g. Um, this will imply that the linearized operator is self-adjoint, so the spectrum will be real, and it will also um, give me a way to think about a symplectic structure. So I'll tell you what I mean by symplectic structure in a bit. Okay, so we're making this assumption about the form of f, and then I'm going to assume I have a stationary solution, and um, just to make the notation easier, I'm going to assume it's a pulse so that the limits at plus and minus infinity are both the same, and I'll denote that by phi infinity. So then we linearize our PDE about the pulse, and I consider the associated eigenvalue problem. So this is what it looks at looks like. Um, and so um, I'm now. So I would say this first assumption I made is is restrictive. It's restricting the class of equations. This next assumption I'm going to make is natural. So I'm going to assume that the essential spectrum of the operator L is stable. Um, if you don't know what essential spectrum is, I would say just just don't worry about this. Um, the point is just that um, if the essential spectrum is already unstable, your, your pulse is in some sense already unstable. And the whole purpose of um, generalizing stern louisville theory is I want to be able to detect instabilities. So if the essential spectrum is already unstable, I, there's kind of, I'm kind of done. So I'm going to assume the essential spectrum is stable. Um, an equivalent assumption is that this matrix, so this is the Hessian of G, evaluated at the end of the pulse. I'm going to assume this is a negative matrix, meaning all of the eigenvalues of this matrix are negative. Um, it's a symmetric matrix, so the eigenvalues are all real. So I'm going to assume those eigenvalues are all negative. This, you, can, you can show that this is equivalent to assuming the essential spectrum of L is stable. OK, so what do those assumptions give me? So here I've just rewritten the eigenvalue problem. Um, I'm going to write it as a first order system, but now in the sort of uh, natural way. So I define ux to be v. And then Vx is whatever it is forced to be based on this original second order equation. But then, so this is now a system in R2n. And I've got this big matrix here. And now I'm going to write it as the product of two matrices. Uh, this matrix in red, um, it's uh, sort of canonically related to a symplectic form. It is usually given a, a name J. Uh, sometimes there's a convention about where that minus sign goes, but it's not a big deal. And then this matrix here in blue, um, the important thing about the matrix in blue is that it is a symmetric matrix. It is symmetric because the eigenvalue parameter is real because the um, operator is real, and it's symmetric because um, this is a symmetric matrix here. Okay, so the question is, can we develop something along the lines of a sturm liouville like theory for these kinds of eigenvalue problems? So, um, Again, some classical results from Arnold generalized the notion of, of phase. So this, um, what we were calling theta before, he generalized the notion of a phase to Rn, or to R2n, I guess I should say, really, um, via the Maslov index and proved some oscillation theorems. Um, but he, he did not connect those oscillation theorems with that idea of phase with the idea of counting eigenvalues of the operator L. So um, Arnold got us kind of like a lot of the way there because he told us how to think about an angle and how to think about oscillation for these systems, but we still need to connect that with um, eigenvalues. And I just want to mention, so in the title of my talk, I also use this other phrase called spatial dynamics. So um, this system, you can think of it as like a, a very um, basic version of spatial dynamics in the sense that here I had a second order equation um, in space. Here, um, the variable x is still a spatial variable, but when I talk about the evolution of this system, I'm now sort of um, like morally thinking of x as being a time-like variable or an evolution variable. So, so sometimes people refer to this as spatial dynamics um, because I'm thinking of the spatial, spatial variable as a time-like evolution variable. Um, so, and that was happening also um, in the scalar case too. Okay. Um, so let me 
I give you a little information about how Arnold uh, figured out how to think about oscillations. So for the next couple slides, you can forget about the context of eigenvalue problems. Um, so um, I'm going to define a symplectic form in um, R2n in the following way. So um, omega is a bilinear form, and it's, it's um, anti-symmetric. So, so the way you evaluate omega on two vectors, u and v, is you take their inner product, but where you multiply v by this matrix j. So remember, j is this special matrix here that's skew symmetric. So, um, if you, so, so omega is skew symmetric. If you switch the order of u and v, you have to put in a minus sign, or you, it, it, it produces a minus sign when you, when you do that switching. OK, so this is my definition of my symplectic form. And now I want to define something called the Lagrangian Grassmannian. So the notation is lambda of n. So the Lagrangian Grassmannian is the set of all subspaces in R2n that have dimension n and such that the symplectic form vanishes if you evaluate it on any two elements of that subspace. So, um, so the Lagrangian Grassmannian is a special class of n-dimensional subspaces in R2n on which the symplectic form vanishes. So each Lagrangian plane has associated to it what's called a frame matrix. So um, A and B are square matrices. They're n by n matrices. And my subspace L is defined this way. So um, it's basically um, the, the range of this frame matrix where I put A in the top block and B in the bottom block. So this is a 2n by n matrix. If I hit it with an n-dimensional vector, I get a, a 2n dimensional vector. And I consider this for all vectors u I, I might carry out this multiplication for, and that tells me what the subspace L is. And so people often go back and forth between referring to the subspace by some notation such as the script L or by just talking about the frame matrix. Um, I should say um, frame matrices aren't unique. There's, there's more than one uh, choices for A and B that you could use to denote a given Lagrangian plane. Um, OK, so um, suppose we have a path of these Lagrangian planes. So, so I have some path parameter t. And um, as I vary t, the subspaces move around in the space of Lagrangian planes. And suppose we're interested in considering intersections of this path of the Lagrangian planes with a fixed reference plane. So for example, if, if n is 1, so I'm in R2, then you know, R2 is just a plane. So subspaces in R2 are just lines to the origin. And so, and in fact, in R2, um, every, every plane is Lagrangian. But um, so in R2, right, this path of subspaces, you can just imagine it's a line through the origin that's just swinging around as I, as I vary my path parameter t. And suppose I want to know when this path of subspaces intersects a fixed reference plane, um, such as this is, a, this is a special plane called the Dirichlet plane. It's the, it's the plane, it's a, the Lagrangian subspace where um, A is the zero matrix and B is any invertible n by n matrix. So for example, you could choose B to be the identity. So, um, so the Dirichlet subspace is, is the set of all vectors in R2n where the first n entries of the vector are zero. So again, in the case where n equals one, so we just have the plane. This Dirichlet subspace is um, the, the vertical axis. OK, and this is called the Dirichlet subspace because, again, if you think back to our scalar eigenvalue problem, if you were to write that second order problem as a first order system in the sort of uh, usual way, your entries of your vector would be u and ux. So Dirichlet, zero Dirichlet boundary conditions are when u is zero. So that's when the, the first entry in the vector u, ux is zero. So that's why people call this the Dirichlet subspace. So um, having this path of subspaces, watching it swing around, and looking for values of t where it intersects the vertical subspace or the Dirichlet subspace, this is very similar to looking for conjugate points like we were doing before. It would be like watching um, u and ux swing around, and as, as you vary a path parameter, maybe you want to call it S now for thinking about conjugate points. And every time we hit the vertical subspace, that means that U is equal to zero so that we have a conjugate point. 
So this is a generalization of the notion of conjugate points. Um, okay. Um, so, okay, so again, if we have a path of these Lagrangian subspaces, we have a one parameter family of frame matrices associated with this path. And what Arnold showed is that you can define in a well-defined way, an angle that I'll call phi associated with this path of subspaces. So the way you do this is you take these, the, the components of the frame matrix A and B, and you form this new matrix here in the brackets that's called W. So um, W is a unitary matrix, um, which means all of its eigenvalues live on the unit circle. Um, and so the determinant, which is just the product of the eigenvalues, is then again going to be on the unit circle. And so we can represent it by e to the i phi. And then phi is the angle that we then associate with this path of Lagrangian planes. So, um, so Ar Arnold proved that, that this all makes sense. And um, moreover, what you can show is, so, so what is this equation saying? So on the right, we have the dimension of the intersection between the Lagrangian planes, the path of Lagrangian planes and the Dirichlet plane. So that's what we're interested in. We want to detect these intersections. And what you can show is that the dimension of that intersection is equal to the dimension of the kernel of this matrix, W plus I. So this matrix W plus I has a non-trivial kernel when um, W has an eigenvalue of minus one. So um, what this is doing is it's saying, if you just track the eigenvalues of this matrix W and count every time one or more than one of them uh, pass through minus one, by counting those eigenvalues as they move through minus one, your um, counting intersections and moreover your counting dimensions of intersections of this path of Lagrangian planes with the Dirichlet subspace. So this thing called the Maslow index, so this other word I mentioned in the title, okay, the Maslow index, I'm not gonna write down the definition, but it's, 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 it's a count with multiplicity and direction of the number of times that an eigenvalue crosses through minus one, an eigenvalue of this unitary matrix W crosses through minus one. Okay, um, and the reason why this works and the reason why it makes sense to define this angle, um, it's related to the fact that the fundamental group of the Lagrangian Grassmannian is the integers. So if you if you do not, if you're not familiar with fundamental groups, that's fine. This is, you can just ignore this as like a side comment. Um, if you are familiar with the concept of fundamental groups, the fact that it's the integers means there's like a, a winding or an angle or an oscillation that we can think about precisely. This is kind of like, um, doing a winding number calculation in the complex plane. So the fundamental group of the punctured complex plane, so complex plane with the zero removed, with the origin removed, is also the integers. And that's why it makes sense to talk about if you have a closed curve in the complex plane, um, the number of times it goes around the origin. Um, it's related to this. So um, if the path of Lagrangian planes is a loop, meaning it starts and ends at the same place, then its Maslow index is just its equivalence class in this fundamental group. Um, okay, so um, that was like a side comment talking about Lagrangian planes and how we define an angle and what this this thing of the Maslow index is. So I know I'm 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 almost out of time. So let me just get to the punchline for this case of systems. So um, again, this is back to our eigenvalue problem. This is the eigenvalue problem we really want to understand. Um, we've made this assumption that implies the essential spectrum is um, stable, um, which also implies that the asymptotic matrices on the right-hand side here are both hyperbolic, and you can check that they both have to have um, um, stable and unstable eigenspaces of dimension n. So um, that means if we consider the subspaces of solutions that like start at plus and minus infinity and are decaying, and we flow them in x, those subspaces also have to have dimension n. Um, so this is related to what um, people often think of, you know, is often referred to as the Evans function. So one way to think about eigenfunctions is that to have an eigenfunction of this equation, you need a solution that decays to zero at both ends, which means it has to live in the intersection of the unstable subspace from minus infinity. So that's the stuff that decays to zero in backwards time and the stable subspace at plus infinity, which is the stuff that decays to zero in forwards time. Um, Non-trivial intersections of these two subspaces correspond to zeros of the Evans function. 
Um, it turns out that both of these planes are uh, um, paths of Lagrangian subspaces. So um, rather than looking for eigenvalues directly by looking for zeros of the Evans function, we could instead look for conjugate points. We could say, okay, I've say got this path of Lagrangian planes. For example, I can take the unstable subspace coming from minus infinity. And we can ask when it has a non-trivial intersection with the Dirichlet subspace. Um, that would correspond to a conjugate point. So that's analogous to the notion of conjugate point in the sturm louisville case. Um, let me skip that slide. And so then using this notion of conjugate point, what you can prove, so this is the main result, like one of the main results that came out of this square, um, this the aim square, um, not the square of this picture, um, is that so we proved that, 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 that our theorem is that we have this same square relationship relating eigenvalues to conjugate points in the case of systems um, that we had in the case of uh, the scalar case of sturm louisville theory. So we prove this when you have an eigenvalue problem of this form. So you need to make this assumption that the original function f was a gradient so that you have a symmetric matrix here. Um, and then we prove that you can count conjugate points by, um, excuse me, count unstable eigenvalues by counting conjugate points. Um, it, this, the picture of the square looks a little bit funny because we proved this for x in the infinite real line. So like this, the vertical sides of the square here are sort of infinitely long. Um, so one step in the proof is um, we have to like do a little bit of a compactification of the spatial domain, um, which, which means maybe this picture isn't quite as, as funny as, as you might think it is by, by, by thinking of these sides as having infinite length. Um, but in any, in any case, um, that's the, the, the main result um, of in the system case. And let me just end by making one last comment. So we started out um, with sturm louisville theory, which tells you how to count eigenvalues by instead of counting conjugate points in the scalar case. And the first question I mentioned was, um, you know, okay, does this generalize to systems? So I hope I have given you some sense that, uh, of that it does, well, I've, I've, I've shown you that it does generalize to systems. Um, I hope I've given you some sense of how you do that using this um, angle that's kind of connected with this Maslow index. Um, the other question I mentioned was, okay, can you generalize this to um, higher uh, spatial domains of dimension greater than one? And the answer is you can also do that there. Um, and um, so, so, so some of the people from the square, not myself, but um, Graham Cox, Chris Jones, Yuri Liturchkin, and Aline Suktayev have some results in, in that direction. You can also prove similar results that give you this square picture in the case of higher space dimensions. Um, and then maybe a final comment I make, so um, I, which I, I don't have time to say more than just a brief comment about, is that this idea of spatial dynamics that I mentioned before, um, where you think of the spatial variable X as an evolution variable, there's kind of a natural way to do that if your spatial domain is one dimensional. But if your spatial domain is multidimensional, it's not at all clear how to do that unless you have like a channel or some kind of distinguished spatial direction. And so I will say that the analysis that um, people have done to extend this square picture to the multidimensional case also suggests a way to define a spatial dynamics in higher space dimensions. And so there are some recent results by myself and some of the same group of collaborators um, where we um, sort of make that notion of spatial dynamics for higher dimensional spatial domains a little bit more precise. And so what we're currently working on is how to use those ideas of spatial dimensions, spatial dynamics in higher dimensions um, as a tool for, for doing other things, a uh, variety. Uh, why, uh, put, I mean, uh, you know, spatial dynamics in one dimension has been used in a variety of contexts from existence theory, bifurcation theory, stability theory. And so we're optimistic that this multidimensional spatial dynamics will be similarly useful, but I would say that a lot of work needs to be done to see if it, it really will be that useful. So anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you very much um, for your attention and for the great questions.